everything. <laughs> Oh, great, great, great. I really could, could probably listen to that jam all day and dance, which I think I would consider a successful conversation. Uh, music and dance is an expression of communication. So, um, but greetings, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for joining us for this thoughtful conversation. You have joined the Rivers and Water for All some um, conversation. Um, I am Rhonda Chapman. I'm with the Trust for Public Land. And we're going to be having a reflective conversation about the evolution of river conservation and justice over the last 10 to 20 years. We're going to be talking about what some of the biggest challenges have been and continue to be. We're going to talk about what some of the greatest opportunities are that are sitting right in front of us. Um, and so we're hoping that the journey ahead is going to lead us, lead us more towards clean water and healthy rivers for you and for me and everybody that we care for. So I'm going to take a moment to introduce our amazing panel. You are probably familiar with many, if not all, in some way or another. Um, most recently, some of us had had an opportunity to witness um, Nataki Osborne jokes. I, I'm kind of doing a little plug <laughs> very selfishly, but I, I had a chance to see uh, Nataki on uh, my Instagram feed through some work that, that she was doing, a conversation that was taking place around her leadership in Atlanta. Um, and Nataki is a nationally recognized leader in engaging urban communities and youth of color in environmental stewardship through hands-on watershed and land restoration initiatives, environmental education, and training. In 2001, Nataki founded the Atlanta Earth Tomorrow Program, the National Wildlife Federation's Multicultural Youth Environmental Education and Leadership Development Program, which engages urban youth in investigating causes of environmental challenges, amongst many other things. We're also going to be joined by Raj Shukla. Raj has built a career um, designing behavior change programs to tackle climate change, training candidates on how to win campaigns and organizing businesses to meet social needs. He is the Midwest Director of Freshwater Policy at the Nature Conservancy. In this role, he organizes scientists, policy professionals, and local advocates to align freshwater policy goals with resources and, managing, and messaging across five Western states. And Raj is also a member of the River Network Board of Directors. We're also joined by Tom Kiernan. Tom just became the president and CEO of American Rivers in February of this year. He's now leading 78 staff that make American Rivers the nation's most trusted and influential river conservation organization. And throughout his career, Tom has been dedicated to protecting the nation's lands and waters, diversifying the conservation movement and advancing innovative solutions to benefit people and nature. And we're also joined by Nicole Silk. Some of you may be familiar with her, Nicole understands how people relate to water and what water needs remain, excuse me, and what water needs to remain healthy as being a central tenant of her professional career for more than 25 years. I'm stumbling over my words because I want to make up my own bio of Nicole based on what I've experienced with her um, through her leadership at the River Network. She believes strongly in the role of local champions and river enthusiasts in creating a just and sustainable future that includes equitable access to clean water and healthy rivers. Nicole is the president of River Network and she's responsible for guiding the network towards its mission in collaboration with staff and board members, engaging our supporters and partners and expanding River Network's reputation and public image motivating staff amongst a whole host of other things. And as I said, I'm Rhonda and I'm the equity director with the Trust for Public Land. I joined the Trust for Public Land in January of this year. 
And that's an organization that works to bring parks and nature to places and peoples and communities that most benefit, particularly in the matter of health, equity, justice, and climate resilience. So that's who we are. You're about to know even more um, as we get um, deep into this conversation. So let's get started. You know, when we have these kind of uh, platforms and these opportunities to talk about the things that we know and the things that we don't know, um, it's always in important for us to get started with our humanity, our shared humanity. And so we know that um, not only for those of us on this panel or moderating this conversation, but for probably many of you, this work is really personal to all of us. And so I'm gonna turn to you, Nataki, to ask you, um, what is it that brought you to this space? Whether you see this work as your vocation or whether this is just a point of employment for you. Can you kick us off, Nataki? Sure, thank you so much for that, Rhonda, um, and for um, your very generous uh, introductions. So when I think about what sort of thrust me into this work, um, I think I, I first came to environmental work first um, and then um, the focus on water came a little bit secondarily. But I got interested in this work because I grew up for a portion of my life um, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in what may consider to be the Cancer Alley Corridor, um, where you have over 135 or so petrochemical companies and other pollution generating facilities between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana, um, along the Mississippi River Corridor. And so after living there, um, you know, I just Noticed, noticed a number of things in terms of personal um, reactions. So, you know, all anecdotal, um, but after living in that area, um, I had um, a condition that the doctors called um, uh, hypopigmentation. So I had these really light colored splotches on my skin. Really, you know, just anecdotal. Um, but, you know, in terms of visiting doctors, they performed a battery of, you know, allergy tests to see if it was something that I was eating, maybe laundry detergent that we were using. They could never come up with anything. But I didn't have that before I went. And when I moved, it went away. Um, also, during, um, shortly after that time, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so, again, you know, the lights just, uh, the, the, the lights went off in my head. It wasn't the fact that we can, you know, say beyond any shadow of a doubt that what we may have been exposed to led to that diagnosis, but really just the fact that that possibility existed gave me this impetus to want to be involved, um, to work in communities and with communities who are facing um, different types of environmental harms and threats. And I can remember vividly that the pollution index was always high. The air smelled bad, the water smelled and tasted bad. Um, and you know, when I, just talking to my mother yesterday, I, I learned of some other things that I was not aware of um, that, again, could have had an impact on our health. And so that possibility existed. That really gave me the impetus to get involved. And if I fast forward several years to my time in Atlanta, I came to Atlanta to go to college and, and just, I've stayed. It's like, you know, it's home now. I've lived here longer than any other place that I've ever lived. Um, but I find myself on the west side of Atlanta, where there are a number of environmental hazards and stressors um, that communities face. And in particular, this is where I got engaged in um, working on water and watershed related issues. Um, through West Atlanta and really through a number of Atlanta neighborhoods, creeks and streams flow through our front yards, backyards, school grounds, and public parks. And um, many years ago, um, you know, my community was facing um, issues around wastewater treatment. Um, essentially, the city of Atlanta was planning to put um, a combined sewer overflow facility into a community park without community input uh, or engagement. And so after being connected to community residents who were working on these challenges, um, I became obsessed, I would say, um, with looking at the ways that we can invest in our communities, invest in our water resources, um, and other environmental conditions to make our communities cleaner, greener, healthier, and more sustainable, you know, with this idea that having um, a quality and clean environment impacts health in, in, a, um, in a very significant way. Um, so kind of the sum total of these different experiences living in Louisiana, living on the west side of Atlanta, um, really gave me no choice but to be involved in this movement. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, that's powerful. The disinvestment gets turned around and becomes an investment of your time, your resources, your knowledge. That's, that's real. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to turn it over to Tom with the same question. What is it that brings you into this field, this line of work? Well, thank you, Rhonda, um, for the question. And it's wonderful to be on this panel with Raj and Nataki and Nicole, and uh, great to, to be with everybody. Um, a quick summary for me, when I was a young boy, um, actually here in what's now Arlington, Virginia, what was the ancestral or is the ancestral lands of the Nakachtank people, I um, lost my father when I was seven years old. He was killed in Vietnam. And as a result of that, as a young boy, I was, um, I think it's pretty fair to say, lost emotionally. And um, it was the creek across the street where I spent countless hours exploring um, that creek, exploring the summer fishing camp of the Koch tank because there were remnants up there. Um, Donaldson Run, that creek went down to the Potomac River. So it was at an early age that I found solace, love, support um, uh, in the natural world, in the creeks, in moving water. And um, I will say it was in high school, I took an environmental chemistry class where we read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And for me, a light bulb went off. It was like, wow, this, these places that give me such love and support that where I, I often say I physically and emotionally grew up in that creek, uh, those places, there was a calling, there was a profession, a career, a need to protect. So from an early age, I knew I would do this type of work. Um, I'll also, I, I do want to say, while I had some serious challenges growing up without a father, I also, I'm a, a white male, cisgender, and a lot of privilege as well. So it's been um, an odd journey where I've had a lot of privilege and a lot of challenge trying to find my own way. And I don't know what that all means, but um, I'm still very much on a journey, perhaps as we all are. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. We don't we don't call it Mother Nature for no reason, right? That's exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you, Nicole. Can you share? Sure. Um, I, I probably have little bits and pieces of all these stories, right? We all have different variations of our own personal narratives. So I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, to a single mom and um, I was very fortunate to have a city park across um, the street um, that had hills and topography in it and some creeks that flowed through it and I knew all of those creeks and where to find the turtles and the salamanders and at some point in time I brought home a whole pile of snails and told my mom I was going to be growing snails. It was pretty hilarious but growing up in the Bay Area in the early 70s and through the mid 70s um, was a time of, um, I, I mean, I've really considered myself incredibly privileged. Um, in Berkeley and Oakland, there was a lot going on. There was a free speech movement. There was a lot of stuff having to do with civil rights. There were protests all the time. It was an incredibly diverse place to grow up. I grew up with African-American and Latinx and Asian-American friends and, and many of those people are still my friends today. So when I found my calling and said, okay, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to figure out how to do this career in conservation. And then I got out of college and started working. I looked around, I'm like, uh-oh, how come this world is so white? It wasn't my upbringing. It wasn't what I was exposed to. I felt very uncomfortable in that space. And, um, wanted something more interesting and certainly more um, aligned with my own personal values. That said, um, early on in my career in conservation, I straddled um, uh, what I could find uh, in terms of work, which was not much, with guiding, being a whitewater guide. And fascinating, um, I found more diversity in that space, both amongst the people that were coming on our trips. And granted that was California and we're talking now 
about the 80s and into the early 90s. But um, the guides and the people on our trips and then um, my adventures outside of this country, um, that's where I found diversity. Um, it was years later after working for actually the Nature Conservancy for a long time and coming into this role at River Network that I felt um, like this was the journey, this was the right time to really be pushing on how do we begin to build a more complete picture of conservation, a more complete picture of how we are gonna get to this future that does include clean rivers and and health of an entire ecosystem that does not cut off the door at particular neighborhoods, but says, hey, this is a resource for all of us. What are we gonna do with it? Um, so yeah, that's my calling. Thank you, Nicole. It's like the, the, the political is the personal and diversity inspires, right? Those are definitely two key factors um, that led you to this place, it sounds like, so thank you. Raj, can you close us out with that question? I can try. Um, I can try and, and thank you all for being here today. I'm very, I'm proud to be included amongst this group of panelists and grateful for the chance. Um, I, I'm kind of an accidental environmentalist. Like I, was, I wasn't conscious of the, the environment as a calling for me until much later in life. And like a few events that all happened within a few years. Um, and the first was Hurricane Katrina, which hit, um, what is it? It's more than 15 years now, something like that. Um, and I, my wife and I were moving and I was between jobs and had this chance to like, I'm gonna go try and help as this storm ravaged a community. And I went and saw what it did to New Orleans. And I saw what our government then did to New Orleans and um, saw very clearly the link between people and the environment, equity and the environment. Um, and so I kind of devoted my life to figuring out climate change and figuring out how I could help in whatever way that was. Um, and as you go down that sort of intellectual journey, I started realizing like my family in India relies on water from glaciers that will be gone in just a, a few years. Um, and the personal <laughs> became very, very much a part of that it was only deepened when I had a, I had my first daughter around that time, a daughter with a disability. And suddenly my own family was vulnerable in a way to the world, in a way that it hadn't been before. And uh, climate change, its societal effect, the personal impact um, made a personal, uh, just sort of driving me. I just had to, had to work on this in some way, shape or form um, through the world of, uh, so, I've made software, I've, run, I've worked at a river conservation organization, I work at TNC now um, because I want to marry the work of conservation, the work of the environment with the work of equity. My job there is to demonstrate that the Midwest is one of the most important places in the world as far as freshwater is concerned as climate change marches forward and my job is to help figure out how we make sure we use that power in a way that benefits everybody and, and not just a few. And so here we are. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Raj. Um, it's, it's interesting how um, all of us in this field, we hear the word vulnerability used um, in various ways. And I know for me, I, I often question how people are defining it and, and whether it's something that they truly have experienced. And in all of your stories, there is a story of vulnerability, um, whether we're talking about our health, whether we're talking about our home life, whether we're talking about, you know, our gender equity, whether, you know, whether we're talking about our families miles and miles and miles away. Um, it's a very real thing. It's a very grounding truth for all of us. So thank you all for being vulnerable, actually, and sharing your personal stories, because we don't always go there. So. And Rhonda, if I can also just say, and it's lovely that vulnerability kind of initiates that sense of community, that coming together, that we all have shared challenges, issues, and we all share that and we want to work together. Sorry to jump in, but I, I'm moved by your summary on vulnerability and how, at least for me, that kind of the next 
feeling is one of community and, and being together. I appreciate that, Tom. And maybe this is a good moment to say that this is a conversation. We are all now peers and friends. We're colleagues, personally, professionally. And so um, I, I welcome you all to challenge each other and to build on one another as you're sharing responses to the questions that I'm going to be asking. And if we are getting questions from the audience, you know, let's, let's have a good time. Let's have a good time with this. Um, we've been doing it for a long time and we love it. So, but with that, I am going to shift to a question that is uh, <laughs> already determined. Um, when you think about the organizations that you're with and you all have, you know, different lengths of tenure in your current roles, um, what are some of the shifts that you are seeing within your organization that are elevating the justice or the injustice, or the equity or the inequity, um, that there are the components of your programs and the investment. So where, where is justice? <laughs> where is equity in the work that you're leading and, and in the time that either before you came on to the organization or in the time that you've been with your organization, where have you seen a shift at all, if any? Um, I'm gonna start with you, Tom, on this one. Happy to start and look forward, as you said, to the discussion. Um, and you acknowledged I'm new with American Rivers, so learning a lot. I will um, observe. I mean, I think it's very evident within the staff and the board that we do look at the environmental injustices in this country as a crisis, as we also look at the climate crisis um, and arguably a biodiversity crisis. But so our work to create rivers that are healthy and clean water for all, our work on environmental justice needs, is, or needs to be central to what we're doing. Um, but I'll be the first to say American Rivers has been working hard at that for several years, but we're far from having that figured out or having that integrally uh, embedded within the work of American Rivers. Um, we're, you know, yes, we've got a DEI committee of the board, DEI committee on the staff, we're working together, we've been going through trainings, we've got a plan, but, um, you know, that's, that's uh, for the last couple of years, that's a great beginning. Um, so, I, you know, I think we have a lot more we need to do. We were, I was talking with a staff colleague this morning, I mean, American Rivers was founded uh, mostly by a group of white men, um, you know, so our heritage comes out of, to a degree where many of the traditional larger environmental groups um, came uh, from. Um, we've been doing a bunch of work, um, I know in Atlanta, Nataki, with, with you and other colleagues in Atlanta, um, on Entrenchment Creek and with Eco Action, um, and we're still trying to figure out how to be a better partner. You know, at times American Rivers has, you know, done some re-grants. That's good, but more importantly, we've got to be, um, we and we are working on this, supporting and elevating uh, organizations, especially small ones led by people of color, so that they have the relationships with funders. Um, so, you know, we're we're trying, we're working on it. Here again, as an organization, it's it's a bit of a journey and. We're learning from others in that process. So that's at least, Rhonda, perhaps a start. Look forward to hearing uh, the work of other groups. That is a start. I appreciate hearing, um, you know, in my mind, as, I'm, as I hear you talk, I hear that as a little bit of power mapping and recognizing the power that you all have had uh, over time, particularly um, as it's rooted in your origin story. I think that our origin stories really can set us up um, moving forward and yep. kind of understanding where we came from to determine where we're going. And so with that, um, Nataki, thinking about the work that's coming out of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance and, and frankly, any of the other organizations that you are affiliated with, but thinking about Wawa specifically, what kind of sh shifts or pivots have you all had to make um, in terms of justice? if any at all. Thank you for that, Rhonda. Um, so let me just start by saying, when you talk about origin stories, um, West Atlanta Watershed Alliance um, 
we affectionately call it Wawa, really started um, because of um, environmental injustices, you know, in the city of Atlanta, in Southwest Atlanta in particular. And I started to kind of talk a little bit about this earlier. Um, in Southwest Atlanta, you know, uh, the city of Atlanta was planning to build a combined sewer overflow facility in a community park. Um, and when community residents found out about it, you know, they were previously unaware. The city council person for the area was also one unaware. When he found out, he let the community know, um, and the community started to organize, um, not only to oppose um, what the city was doing, but they also researched what other cities were doing, how were other cities dealing with and addressing combined sewers, and they came up with a citizen's plan um, that they put forward to the city to separate the sewer system. You know, so not only do we not want you to put this um, CSO facility in our park, but we want you to separate our sewer system, you know, in this area of the city. And so there was considerable um, struggle, but ultimately the community prevailed. Um, they also then um, challenged another plan that the city put forward to um, build an eight mile um, deep rock sewage tunnel that would go from the north side of town to southwest Atlanta. And so community residents also said, well, we don't want the waste coming from the north side of town and from a neighboring county um, to be you know, shipped essentially to our treatment plant. Um, you know, why can't it be treated where it is, you know, where it's generated? Um, so this other community fight um, ensued and ultimately again, the community was um, prevailed and was successful. And so on the heels of those victories, um, there were many of us who decided, and I was, you know, essentially a college student, you know, graduating from college, um, but I got a chance to, you know, work hand in hand with a lot of the community elders. And we decided that we not only needed an organization to challenge some of these negative um, policies and, and practices, um, but that we also needed an organization that was going to put forward a positive vision for what we want um, our communities to be on the west side of Atlanta. Um, and so this origin, you know, is, is rooted in struggle. It's rooted in challenging environmental injustices. It's rooted in trying to make a space um, for people who have been left out of decision making, you know, around our water resources and a number of other, you know, related issues. Um, and so we continue to do that work um, and we see it, you know, as important as when we started um, to push this work forward, um, because unfortunately, when you have centuries um, of, you know, um, racialized policies that have been put into place, you know, we can't break them down um, in, in a few years or even 20 years, you know, we've been around for over 20 years, um, but we still, you know, have so many struggles to fight. So we are still, you know, entrenched in this work. And I would say in terms of, you know, if there are shifts, um, it is now that, um, there are others who are finally starting to listen. You know, when we talk about the phil philanthropic community, for instance, um, you know, for so many years, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's good work. You know, keep, keep, you guys are so great. You know, keep doing that work. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, being invited to, you know, panel discussions like this um, and, you know, getting the, the pats on the back, um, but not getting the investments in our work to keep it moving forward has been a real thing, but we're starting to see some shifts happen now. And so I, I see that as very positive. That's great. Thank you, Nataki. Um, definitely um, turn to you because of the origin story. And I think that's really valuable. And I, and I want to shift over to Nicole, um, selfishly as a, as a partner of the River Network, as a board member of the River Network, I know that I've been able to observe some changes over the last several years. And so when we hear stories about things that are happening in Western, West Atlanta, and we think about the mission that the River Network has to support river health and human health, the relationship between the two, I wasn't around when River Network was, was formed years ago, um, but I don't know how much of that is tied to its origin story. But I do know since you've come on board as president and CEO, some of these shifts have taken place. So I'm kind of feeding you a little bit of your own answer, but would you mind telling us a story about the shifts that you've seen? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to be 
brief. There's a lot of information about this, um, some of which you might actually hear if you um, join the Compton panel um, at this year's uh, River Rally. And also there's um, uh, on our website, um, there's some information about our timeline and our story, but in short, um, so River Network's been around for about 33 years. Our story of origin actually ties back to American rivers. Um, so our founder is a guy named Phil Walleen, um, who was in the land trust movement, if you will, and was working at the local level in New Mexico on the Chama River. And there was a bunch of folks who didn't want to see that river dammed. And he started looking around for, well, who could he get uh, to help this nice group of local uh, uh, folks who wanted to stop the dam. He couldn't find an organization to turn to. So that's what, in a sense, brought River Network into being. He actually reached out to American Rivers and the Conservation Fund and some folks at the Nature Conservancy and others. And there was just no organization that was willing to take on supporting the truly local um, 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 fights and capacity that we really need, those folks that are on the front lines all over the country that are really paying attention to how do we do a better job with our rivers, but also how do we do a better job with our communities and water. So over um, that 33 year period, this organization has had the opportunity to work um, with tribes, um, to work with um, folks on the front lines in urban areas, and primarily though, to work with river and watershed conservation organizations. So we, have, we had all of that in our history. We had also diversity on our board. So there was this, this like desire um, and interest and recognition that the needs of local organizations are really, really wide ranging across this country from rural to urban, from conservative areas to progressive, from environmental justice issues to um, challenges around, well, how do you find dollars to protect and restore rivers? Um, when I came into this organization now, amazed to say, over seven years ago, um, the board at the time said, we really want to center this organization more around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are you interested in doing that? And I said, absolutely, let's do it. So then, you know, I came into the organization and found we really didn't have a lot of resources, a lot of financial flexibility. And so, you know, one of the challenges was we had the ambition, we had the appetite, but we couldn't convince the funding community to go along with us. Um, so that was kind of where we were when I came in and I said, well, let's sort of see what we can do starting now internally and externally to begin to change our value proposition and our narrative if we really are going to be successful, not just as River Network, but as a, as sort of a, a broader movement for our rivers, it's gotta become a movement that's more diverse and more inclusive. So what's our role? So um, in short, um, the some of what we did as an organization was shoring up our own internal practices, really dedicating ourselves to sort of the personal, the organizational and the community journey, which is a never ending journey. I think if you're interested in issues of justice, um, whether that be about climate justice, environmental justice or other aspects, it's, you know, you've got to remain really, really curious for a long time. We also developed something, we have an equity tool that we use that challenges us internally to say for any of our programmatic deliverables, are we giving space to think about the equity implications? Could we change how we're doing what we're doing and make it, make it more seated in equity? And that is really how we have turned some of our programmatic efforts to be more focused on the challenges that are at the intersection in equity. It's become kind of a hallmark of how we do our work now, and there's more to do, um, but I'm, I've been just incredibly 
oh, I don't know, proud of this team, excited to be part of this effort. I know it, is, it does involve all of you and everybody who's listening today as well. Thank you, Nicole. I'm hey, gonna- Rhonda, can I uh, jump in again? Sorry. I sure. just want to comment yeah, on Nicole's point that um, a tool inside the organization, I do think is critically important one quick example, we have our Most Endangered Rivers report, and that for us has become a tool to highlight environmental injustices, especially this last year, seven different rivers. So the only reason having internal processes that, I don't mean to say force, but catalyze equity discussions, I think it are an important mechanism to ingrain them in what we do. Um, uh, on a daily basis. So just to put that out as a thought about how to change the culture of an organization, those types of tools that make it happen inside are a great idea from Nicole. Yeah, thank you. So two things, one, I wanna hear from Raj um, on this answer. And then second to that, um, even though we are asking all of the participants to put their questions into the Q&A, we want you all to continue to do that. It's easier for us to monitor. But I want to open the door to the panelists. If you all decide that there's something that you want to provide a link to, put that in the chat room. If you want to point folks to maybe a tool that is public or a report that has recently come out from your organization, feel free to drop that into the chat. Make sure that you make it accessible to everybody in case you want to share. That way we can you know, continue to, to build resources if we run out of time. So, um, cause I think, I think what you just named Tom building on of building off of what Nicole shared is, is really helpful. So thank you for that. Just want to invite you all to do that. So Raj, I know that you're very new at TNC and it might feel like an unfair question, but you started to talk about this when you were talking about your vocation and why you're doing this work and the decision that you made to go to TNC in the first place. So you knew something, what can you say about the shifts or the pivots that are happening there? Well, I think, I mean, and others have alluded to this, but just there is a shift in consciousness around issues of race, around issues of equity across society, but certainly in the environmental community uh, as well, and in particular. Um, and I think Nicole is um, shone a light on like, well, resources are like starting to follow now. <laughs> now there are funders who are interested in funding equity specifically. Um, around environmental issues and conservation issues. Um, but I think the next step is for organizations like TNC, organizations like American Rivers, like River Network, um, to start shifting power, <laughs> like shifting actual power in the community. And that means everything from people in positions like mine, like Nicole's, like not Tom's, like Nutaki's, um, like yours, to like build a leadership pipeline and st and start focusing on blocking for the next wave of like leaders to come forward, folks who probably should have been in leadership positions then uh, but haven't been. Um, so like focus real strong on our blocking, and then also like what are the material investments we are making in on the ground organizations that are often way less naive than big green organizations like the one that I work with and would say, we would say that right up, right up front. Um, and also often way more resourceful, sometimes out of necessity, sometimes just because. Um, we need to find ways to actually shift material power to different folks. And that's a, that's a hard question, um, but that's why we're here today. Awesome. One of the things I love about being moderator is um, I'm not responsible for answering these really important questions. And I have the privilege of pulling from the Q&A. So I know that we had some, qu some questions that we talked about together, but this one is um, that came up is one I want to share with all of you and you can determine amongst yourself who answers. If you don't want to like speak up, I'll call on you. And, and, I'll, and I'll state for the record that this is something that's really, um, something I've been holding in my heart and I'm really happy to see the question because it, did, it didn't come from me. And it's kind of a carryover from the work I was doing previously with Policy Lake and water equity and climate resilience. And the question is this, how can your organizations foster more integrated approaches 
toward access to water as a human right and not just as a commodified resource. So I don't know if you all recall, and while I'm gonna speak while you're thinking about it. In 2020, when the pandemic struck, we had situations across the country, namely in Michigan, in the Gulf South, uh, in New Mexico, where we were all being advised to wash our hands. At the same time, there were individuals that did not have water for a whole host of unjust reasons, right? You can't wash your hands if you have no water. And so we saw a lot of energy coming particularly out of uh, Michigan, coming out of Detroit and coming out of Flint with uh, Representative Talib, for example, declaring that water is a human right. And so when you think about the missions of your organization and the relationships that you are um, elevating and deepening at the same time with community, what kind of integrated approaches can you all entertain, if not implement, in terms of making water um, a human right, as opposed to a, a commodified resource? It's a deep question, I love it. Yeah, that's such a deep question. Well, I'm gonna throw in here, because I love this question. Um, just to kick us off and say, I think this is exactly where we need to be going. Um, I've actually always thought about water as a human right. You know, it got close to being um, really accepted in the international community as a human right. I think we have a long way to go to get there truly in this country. Um, in the conservation sector, I, I would say I was, I, I was privileged, right? I was privy, privy to a period within the conservation world where system thinking became um, how organizations did their work. And with that came a set of tools, conservation planning tools for prioritizing efforts. Hey, I think this is the time that we need to think about all of those planning tools, which are really awesome, that help us focus investments and say, how can we do this in a way that also challenges us to think about water as a human right and some of the other equity issues that are in play. So that is sort of part of what I've been thinking about. I think we need some new tools. Raj, I saw you raise your hand. What would you like to share? Yeah, partly just a shout out to River Alliance of Wisconsin where I used to work and we were supporting local organizations uh, asking their counties uh, to demand a right to clean water through the county referenda uh, process. So um, hugely important work. And that was one approach that you know, I've been involved with. As far as the, the organization that I'm with now, um, which is, I think it needs to get used to being an advocate, to having a point, a, a particular point of view on the primacy of water, uh, on how we should regard it in our kind of people sphere. And, I, you know, that's a, an evolving process. I think just now we're releasing as part of our kind of blueprint for conservation, so called conservation by design. It's including specific people goals for, you know, the first time. And that is a huge step. Um, and um, that's what I'm excited about. I don't know that that's going to get to like a full throated, <laughs> let's push for rights for clean water. Um, but they'll hear about it. I know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Anybody else want to chime in? No pressure. I'll just say, and, and congrats, Raj, that sounds um, really important um, for a conservation organization to talk about and to center some people goals alongside environmental goals. Um, but in, in terms of this, this human rights issue, I mean, definitely, I, I think that, you know, communities of color um, have always seen, you know, water as a human right access to, you know, safe, um, affordable water, um, also expanding that into access to, you know, adequate um, sanitation. Um, you know, we still have some places, particularly in rural areas, um, where, you know, sanitation is not even, um, you know, a right that comes to those who pay taxes, you know, to municipalities and to county governments. Um, so, 
you know, I think it's it's long overdue for us to acknowledge water as a human right, but I definitely agree with what is said. We have a long way, way to go. In fact, I was in a communications training workshop on last week, and when we got to this question about you know, environmental quality rights to, you know, things like affordable water. Um, and when, you know, one of the participants said, you know, we would shape our message, you know, to say something about water, you know, being a human right. The facilitator said, well, no, you know, rights-based language is really polarizing. You know, maybe we should just say that everybody deserves, you know, uh, clean water, um, you know, which is also true, right? But, you um, you know, when we think about the, the fundamental um, need for, you know, water to survive, you know, <laughs> indeed it is, you know, a human right. It just isn't acknowledged that way. Um, and and when, we, when we talk about, you know, kind of the pandemic um, and your reference earlier to, you know, Detroit and other places across the country where there were these water shutoffs, um, you know, when we think about water as being, you know, a part of the PPE, right, that we need, um, then how can we, you know, deny that access to folks? Yet it, it has been done um, and continues to be done. So um, a lot of work that we need to, to, to do to get to this, you know, idea both in, in word and in practice that water is a human right. Thank you, Nataki. Um, I'll jump in, uh, just a uh, quick pause, just with um, the observation, American Rivers, along with other organizations, we do a lot with the tribal community, with Native Americans throughout the country, and I'll just observe, it's been wonderful um, frames, perspectives that the tribal community brings to some of these issues. So I'm very comfortable with uh, water as a human right and um, some of the discussions I was talking with um, uh, a tribal member up in Maine uh, with the Penobscot people, and he was talking about, we've been on this land for 10,000 years. And that's suddenly like, whoa, that's a different frame. You know, and it's like, uh, all right, I got to pause and respect that. So, and the reason I just bring that up is I support the human waters, the human right frame, and there are these other frames very much from tribal and other communities that we uh, need to integrate into our work. Mm. Absolutely. I remember one of the, the comments that I, that I heard from uh, an Indigenous sister, um, an American Indigenous sister, was that uh, water is not a resource, it's a relative. And we need to honor it with the same level of respect that we do any other elder in our family or any other elder that we revere. We have to treat it with care and patience. We have to um, make sure that we don't drain it and strain it, right? We have to love it and honor it all the time. And it's very easy to forget that when you can turn on a tap. It's very easy to forget that when you can't afford your bill. And it's very easy to forget that when you have clean water to play in. And so um, just, a, just a nice reminder, I really, appreci I really appreciate that question and this conversation around it. We have a couple of other um, questions that have come from the audience and in the name of inclusion, I want to uh, continue to honor them as well and put my own questions aside because this is not the Rhonda show. So there's one question <laughs> that's being offered that kind of gets us back to, I think, uh, what we started off with when we talked about our humanity and our relationship with the work that everybody is doing here today. And the question is asking about how you all move forward despite the many challenges that come with doing this kind of environmental advocacy and climate change work. So while you're thinking about that, I'll answer a little bit how I think about this every day. Um, being a Black woman in the United States of America doing equity work for uh, a majority uh, white-led uh, conservation organization that has been around for 50 years. Um, I know for myself, I wake up each day and I have to do a lot of deep breaths and <laughs> to get myself really grounded to see, am I able to do this work today? Um, because I have to also protect myself 
um, in a whole host of ways that are often unseen. And that's my experience as a Black woman in America doing environmental justice work. But I'm curious to hear from the rest of you and all of the parts of your identity that you have to carry each day as you're doing this work moving forward. So how do, how do you keep going despite these challenges? I'll jump in briefly um, as perhaps the oldest person here, I don't know that, but I've been doing this work for a while. Honestly, I've gone through a journey of change on this. Um, there were times, absolutely, I would be exhausted. I'd be depressed. I would be, my gosh, we're not making progress. In fact, we're going backwards and you can get completely exhausted and burnt out the work we do. However, I've come to a point where, um, and maybe I'm being too simplistic, but it's a privilege. It's, it's a, to be able to have my shoulder to the wheel on a cause that matters. And, you know, the globe, the earth, and our societies and, and diverse communities, we've got a lot of problems, um, but it gives meaning to my life to be trying to make a positive difference. And that in its own right is meaningful and powerful. And I don't know where we're gonna end up. I, I don't know if this effort is gonna be durable with something that we've chatted about separately, um, but having our shoulder to the wheel feels good because the alternative of not doing it feels worse. Um, so I, I don't know, I put that out there, but this is good work, work is good, work is meaningful, at least, very much to me and I, I'm sure all of you. Um, so I, I just keep plugging away and appreciating the opportunity to, to try to advance River and people. Thank you, Tom. Itaki, I think I saw you unmute yourself as well. You caught that, didn't you? Um, so I guess, um, you know, in terms of keeping keeping going, um, there's just so much work to be done. And sometimes it does feel a little overwhelming. And sometimes it does feel like, okay, we're moving and, you know, but are we, you know, pushing, you know, is the needle moving enough, even though we are, you know, kind of moving to, to make it, um, you know, go in a, in a different direction. Um, but you know, I, I think I'm just always reminded of um, a lot of our elders in the community who have been out here fighting this fight. And for some of them, you know, health challenges and other things might, you know, have quieted some of that down. And I just feel this responsibility to keep moving, um, to keep going, um, to carry on what, you know, they've started in many ways. Um, so that's really, you know, critically important to me. Um, but also to me, there's a joy in, in doing this work, especially kind of where I am right now, you know, in my life. And I've come, you know, um, I won't say full circle, but, you know, I've worked with um, large conservation organizations and then I made a commitment and, you know, I was very intentional about, you know, now working with, um, you know, working, you know, in my community-based organization. Um, and, you know, not going for the next job with another, you know, big green. Um, and, and so in that intentionality, I am where I want to be doing the work that I want to be doing. Um, and, you know, sometimes it does feel like an uphill challenge, um, whether we're talking about the funding community or just the issues that we face overall. Um, but, you know, there's something about that support, you know, of community members. There's something about working collaboratively with others. We see, you know, some common goals. We have a common vision. Um, and we just are not going to stop until we get what, what it is that we're seeking. Um, and so, you know, I recognize that I can't do it forever. Um, so it's also about investing in that next generation. And that also gives me hope um, that we are, you know, creating these, you know, um, change makers who are going to, you know, work with us and then continue to carry on the work. Thank you. Raj? Uh, sure. I, my answer is so much less like noble <laughs> and good. Like I'm doing this because I have to. Like we, I wake up every day, like so many of you, looking at 
the news and looking at the science and realizing what we are all going heading towards or in the middle of. And like, uh, I can't do anything other than just get up and work with groups like Nataki's, work with groups like Tom's, like Nicole's, like everyone in this network to do the right thing. Because I know for sure that I'm not going to be on Elon Musk's rocket to Mars someday. Like I'm not, for a variety of reasons. And so like, what else is there to do? <laughs> but like, make sure that all of us can live on this, in this world, in peace and uh, with abundance. So. Uh, such a good answer. Um, I, I'll just throw in a, a little bit here at the end to close this one out and and say, yeah, you know, I think it's really important that we we this collective we and anyone else in this work doesn't burn out. So taking the time out of work to do what you need to do, whether that's to reconnect with family, with friends. For me, it's often with my kids and thinking about the world I want to um, have them be able to be part of. Um, and it's also about building just a badass team over here at River Network and you know the small little impact that I can have as a leader is not about my voice, it's about lifting the voices of others, whether that's my team, whether that's folks at the community level that we're working with, elevating those voices, giving them the wings that they need to influence decision makers is how we're gonna get to that different future. So that's really important. On a more personal note, um, I think I'm, I tend to operate in this very sort of dominant culture mentality where for me, it's about what's on my list, how do I get it done? You know, whether that's organizational culture or product or something, that's just how I operate. Lately, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about not just like, what do I wanna get done or what do we wanna get done? But how do I want to be? Like, what do I want to feel? <laughs> and it's been really interesting to still, like, stop and reflect and say, hey, I want to do this in a way that makes me really joyful and at ease and present and able to be really vulnerable with a group of people who I don't know or I do know, whatever it is. So thank you. Thank you all for that. And thank you for that last sentiment. Um, so we're at, about at the top of the hour, and I know that we have the opportunity to expand this a little bit longer. Um, so, the, but there's, we have two options. There is a question um, around funding and foundations and philanthropy, and we've touched on some of that. Um, I think that's a very heavy, meaty question, but it feels um, you know, hopefully there are some foundations or other funders that are listening in on this conversation that are kind of grappling with what their role is and looking for some affirmative language and affirming organizations and leaders to let them know, like, you're on the right track. If you're thinking about how you are prioritizing your mechanisms, your criteria, maybe you're thinking about providing unrestricted funding <laughs> to, to organizations that really are just trying to do the work without having to do it project by project. Um, I would encourage you to keep thinking. You've got some folks here that will give you all of support you need in terms of language and justification and case making. Um, so maybe that's the end of that part of the conversation because um, the other thing, uh, I'll, and I'll let you all tell me which way you want to go, but the other thing that Nicole just shared is um, I, I do like to end conversations around happiness and joy, and so I would love to ask the, the ever corny question <laughs> that is, I think, really necessary around what is it that is giving you the most hope, whether it's for this week, whether it's for uh, this quarter, um, for this year, and it can be on a personal level, um, it can be within your organization, but I do like to end with moments of joy, hope, and aspiration. And so you all tell me, do we wanna talk about philanthropy and stay on here for another hour? Or <laughs> do we, do we wanna close out with a moment and a thought about joy, something that's giving you inspiration right now?
maybe we can integrate them if if we want to. I like the second in general. Um, yeah. There's no joy in philanthropy, is there? <laughs> Sorry, funders. <laughs> so how about this? How about this? All right. If you were a funder, and some of you are intermediaries, right? So, so you can be thinking about that a little bit too, because you do have some responsibility in this. You receive funding and you need to pass that on to another organization. So in a sense, you're kind of wearing a little bit of that hat. Um, maybe it's a beanie, not a full-fledged hat, but I, I do want you to think about if you had your own foundation, right? If you had your own foundation and you think about what you would be prioritizing for your own foundation, what is the one thing that would set you apart from what we're seeing today in philanthropy? How are you going to change the game? And that's what we're that's what we're going to go out on. Talk about throwing us a hard question, Rhonda. <laughs> I, I'll go first, um, and it's related to what you said, Rhonda. Um, shift to unrestricted funds and like focus your funding on teams. Focus. I mean. I think you can talk to venture capitalists. They're going to tell you the same thing that um, what they look to first when they're looking at where they invest their dollars, it's who who is the talent assembled to make this mission real, knowing that there are going to be twists and turns and realities that a, a, a strong team is going to have to navigate and things won't always go the right way. So invest in the team and make your metrics revolve around that team and the people in place to make decisions and not so much on what P value X watershed, like that you can't actually disentangle statistically. Like just don't, don't do that. Focus on the team. Thank you. Love it. It was hard, but y'all do hard work every day. This ain't nothing. <laughs> I mean, I have to just echo what Raj said in terms of unrestricted funding, you know, uh, general operating support. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, while, while it's not easy, it's so much easier to get, you know, um, project funds. And a lot of times those project funds, quite honestly, are, you know, one year grants that are not renewable. So as we think about, you know, funding organizations make some investments over time as well. Um, so that, you know, we, as we talk about the change that we seek, you know, we can't get it in these incremental, you know, one-year grants. <laughs> you know, the start and stop motion of all of that um, is not conducive to keeping, you know, real momentum going. And so being able to recognize that, I think, is really important. Um, and, you know, um, elevating and prioritizing, um, you know, um, Black-led groups, um, you know, other uh, or groups led by other um, people of color. Um, I think that's vitally important um, that that's done um, in so many, you know, instances, you know, there have been analyses of where funding goes. Um, and in some sectors, we're seeing that groups that are, you know, led by Black women in particular are getting the fewest funds. Um, we've definitely seen that in Atlanta, not necessarily in the environmental sector, but, you know, just kind of generally speaking. Um, in terms of our philanthropic community locally. Um, so those types of things need to really be addressed. And so if I had the, the checkbook, um, those were some of the things that I, I'd do with it. I'll so quickly add uh, two things. One there, as I understand it from a discussion yesterday, or somewhere along the way with the Kresge Foundation, there's now a funders pledge that a number of, of the larger funders have signed um, that says they will both be transparent and have a certain percentage go to organizations. I think it's smaller organizations led by people of color. I'm not totally sure the criteria, but I think that's, that's an important, hopeful step um, towards nudging, encouraging, pushing, holding accountable foundations. So I think that's a step forward. And if I uh, had the checkbook for the day, and I'm comfortable with the analogy 
on funding teams. Um, I'd also say catalytic change. Um, we, as a democracy, are struggling and having funders look down the road, how do we better ensure this democracy works and thrives for all people and for uh, the climate crisis? What we're doing now isn't gonna get us there. Um, current trajectory will not work on both of those crises. So we need a catalytic shift and it is the foundation and funding philanthropic community that has the assets to catalyze that type of shift. So if I had the checkbook for the day, I'd be putting some high risk bets. And yes, I'm comfortable with the unrestricted uh, strategy, but I'd be looking for some, some catalytic change. Uh, again, love the question. I'm gonna close you out. Um, so a couple thoughts that have been popping up. Um, one is I just wanna underscore that water is democracy, that if we're serious about figuring out the solutions at the local level, we're talking about rebuilding democracy in this country and let's, let's celebrate that and let's bring some more funders into this space because the water funders community is small, it's limited, but what we're talking about isn't just about water. So just underscore that. Um, the other piece, the two other pieces I wanna bring home, we talked lightly about this concept of durability. You heard Radhika Fox bring it up yesterday in her remarks, the idea of durable solutions. Durable solutions often mean laws and policies and a regulatory framework that supports healthy rivers, clean water, equitable systems, et cetera. I don't think you can achieve any of that without it beginning at the community level and have the voices that haven't been represented at the table when the solutions are being made. So we need to expand this concept of durability. I wanna see funders pushing on that because this concept of durability without this stuff around justice isn't gonna work. It's not gonna be durable, It's not gonna be long lasting. And then um, finally, Back to the idea of catalytic, you know, there can be catalytic efforts in individual communities. If we're not connecting to each other, we're not gonna be able to move as far as we possibly can, you know, back to that African proverb, like we really gotta do it together. So let's not forget funding the connectivity between our individual efforts. So if I had my checkbook, of course, that's what I would fund. All right, we've got a hundred folks that stayed with us. I want to thank you all for hanging in there. There have been some amazing comments and resources that have been populated in the chat. With that, it's 110. I thank you all once again, panelists. You're amazing, River Network. Love you all. And with that, I wish you all joy. I hope that you all find plenty of opportunities to laugh and celebrate one thing today. And with that, we say adieu. And uh, we'll see you soon on the next uh, discussion. So thank you all so much. Peace.